In this video, we'll continue discussing the consequences of symmetry, including degeneracy, uh, the selection rules for scalar operators, and selection rules for vector operators. So the presence of symmetry implies the existence of an operator Q that commutes with the Hamiltonian. That operator is the symmetry operator. And if it commutes with the Hamiltonian, then we can learn something about uh, its transformation of a stationary state of the Hamiltonian. So if we have a stationary state psi sub n, we have a question, what are the properties of psi prime of n where psi prime is equal to q applied to psi sub n? Well, we'll take this state, we apply the Hamiltonian. And so we have h applied to psi prime of n sub n. And that, of course, is h applied to q psi n. But because h and q commute, by definition, then we can rewrite this as qh applied to psi sub n. Of course, psi sub n is an eigenfunction of the Hamiltonian, and it has an eigenvalue e sub n. So you get q applied to e sub n psi sub n, but this is just a scalar, you can pull it through, and we get e sub n times q applied to psi sub n, which of course is e sub n applied to psi prime sub n. So, this says that the states psi sub n and psi prime of n sub n have the same eigenvalue. So a stationary state of the Hamiltonian that's transformed by a symmetry operator which commutes with the Hamiltonian results in a new state with the same energy. If there's only one such operator, Q, or a set of operators, all of which commute with each other, then the eigenfunctions are all mutual for these operators, and they transform into themselves. So what that means is that if you take this transformed eigenfunction, which is q applied to psi sub n, it also is an eigenfunction of q. And all other operators that mutually commute with q and the Hamiltonian. And so psi sub n basically is psi, is psi sub n prime is psi sub n times some constant. It's very different if there are two operators which both commute with Hamiltonian but don't commute with each other. So suppose you have a state psi sub psi which is an eigenfunction of both h and q. So we can write that h applied to psi is e sub n psi and q applied to psi is q sub n psi. If there's a second operator, lambda, which commutes with h but not with q, we can now obtain a new state g by just transforming state psi with lambda. So g is equal to lambda applied to psi. And we know that because this commutes with, the lambda commutes with h, then this is also an eigenfunction of h with eigenvalue e sub n. So if we apply h to g, we'll get e sub n applied times g. But since q and lambda don't commute, it's not possible for g and psi to be mutual eigenfunctions. So g and psi must be different eigenfunctions, but with the same energy. And there, that must lead to a degeneracy. For central potentials, the Hamiltonian computes with L sub x, L sub y, and L sub z. But these three don't commute with each other. And so there must be a degeneracy, and that's why we have degeneracy in the uh, angular functions. The presence of a multiple non-commuting symmetry operators, therefore, guarantees the degeneracy of the energy spectrum, which is what we see in many of these systems. So the next thing we want to talk about is the selection rules for scalar operators. And selection rules are nothing more than understanding how the matrix that represents an operator behaves. So let's start by rewriting uh, commutating relations of a scalar operator F with the angular momentum operator and its components. Let's assume that F commutes with LX, LY, and LZ. It therefore also commutes with L squared. And finally, because it commutes with LX and LY, it commutes with L plus and L minus. So if you take the inner product of these commutators with the two with two eigenstates, 
of definite angular momentum, NLM and N prime, L prime, M prime, we can extract information about what the values of N, L, and M or L and M must be, because this is all angular momentum. So this will uh, affect L and M and L prime and M prime. So the first one we can do is L sub Z. So we put the commutator of L sub Z and F inside this inner product with N prime, L prime, M prime, and NLM. Well, this commutator is just LZ minus F, LZ F minus F LZ. And so we can expand that and we get two inner products, one of which has LZ and F in the middle, and the other one has FLZ. Well, if we apply LZ to the right, we get M times the inner product of, of N prime, L prime, M prime, F, and LM. And over here, because LZ is its own, um, uh, it's its own uh, emission conjugate, we can apply it to the left and get M prime out. And therefore, and then we get the same uh, inner product with f in the middle of these two eigenfunction of these two functions. So therefore, we get that m prime minus m times the inner product of n prime l prime m prime f and l m is equal to zero. So in order for this inner product to be non-zero, this is just a matrix element where you have two different states, they can be arbitrary states, in order for this not to be zero, then m and m prime must be the same. So that's a selection rule that says that in order for you to get a non-zero uh, inner product here, m delta m must be zero. Similarly, we can do the same thing for L, the commutator of l squared and f. Same exact operation. We have uh, the inner product of L squared F minus the inner product of F L squared. We apply L squared to the right, we get L L plus one. We apply L squared to the left, we get L prime times L prime plus one. And we can write that down here as this quantity here in brackets times the inner product again of F with N prime L prime M prime and NLM. Once again, if we want this to be non-zero, then L prime must be equal to L. And that leads to a second selection rule, which is delta L is equal to zero. So when delta L, when L prime is not equal to L, or M prime is not equal to M, then this inner product must be zero. The matrix elements will vanish unless both M and L remain unchanged. For a scalar operator. Well, we can learn a little bit more from the other, from some other commutators, in particular the L plus and L minus commutators. So let's apply now the same thing with the L plus operator. So we have the commutator of L plus and F, which we know is zero, but now we apply uh, this expanding it, we get L plus F and L f l plus and with the same two uh, wave functions now when we apply l plus to this side we raise m to m plus one and we get a constant out when we apply l plus over here since its hermitian conjugate is l minus we will get m prime minus one and a different constant so the constant we get on the left side is B L prime M prime. And then uh, this is now an inner product that says N L prime M prime minus one F and L M. And then on the right, on the second term, we get A L M N prime L prime M prime F and L M plus one. Where A sub L M is just equal to H bar times L times H, the H bar times the square root of LL plus 1 minus MM plus 1. And B, L prime M prime, is just H bar times the square root of L prime times L prime plus 1 minus M prime times M prime minus 1. But remember, for the scalar, we know that delta M equals 0 
and delta L is equal to zero for this matrix element and this matrix element. So for in order for the matrix elements to be non-zero, L prime is equal to L. That doesn't change. But M prime must be M plus one. Because if I put M prime here as M plus one, I get M back. If I put M prime here as M plus one, I get M plus one. And so now I have the same value of, of this third uh, quantum number in both sides. So M prime then is equal to M plus one. And if you look at what this implies for A and B, if you put M prime is equal to M plus one, this becomes M plus one, this becomes M. So it becomes exactly like this term. And since L prime is equal to L, this term is now equal to this term. So A L M is just equal to B L prime M prime. So these two constants are the same. And now we have on the left side, <coughs> N prime L prime M prime, N, N prime L M for this term is F N L M is equal to N prime L M plus one F N L M plus one. And so we see that these two matrix elements have the same n prime, the sa same n on this side, but now you have the same L for both sides. But here, m is equal to m. Here you have m plus 1 is equal to m plus 1. Well, the implication of that is that the matrix elements of a scalar operator do not depend on the value of m. These two matrices and elements are the same, but M doesn't matter. It's just that M and M prime have to be the same. They have to be the same on both sides, but it doesn't matter what value they are. You're going to get a, a matrix element that's independent of M. So what does this say? We says, it says that N prime, L prime, M prime, F, NLM, so this inner product, is equal to the Kronecker delta function of LL prime, the Kronecker delta function of MM prime, times a matrix element that is N prime, L prime, double bar F, double bar L, which means this is a matrix element that does not depend on M or M prime. As long as M and M prime are the same, it doesn't depend on that. So for a generalized vector operator, we're going to start looking at what the vector selection operators, the selection rules do for a vector operator, a symmetry operator. So we'll call that operator V. And it's useful to define generalized raising and lowering operators V plus minus, which is equal to Vx plus or minus Ivy, the usual definition. And these have commutator relations according to the table that we had in a previous video. Commutator of L sub i V sub j is equal to i h bar e epsilon i j k uh, v of k, v sub k. So as long as i, j, and k are in this order, epsilon is 1. If you transpose any two of them, epsilon becomes negative. And if you transpose another, make another transposition, then it turns positive. So for every transposition from this permuting order i, j, k, it could be j, i, uh, k, i, j, k, i, j, or it could be j, k, i. That would be positive. Any transposition gives you negative. So we have Lx, Vx commutator is equal to zero by definition because i and equal to j would give you a zero for the epsilon they have to be all different ly commutator of ly and vx that is in the opposite order so it's x 
x, y, z would be the correct order. This is y, x, z. You get a minus ih bar v sub z. The commutator of lz and vx is in fact in the correct order and you get ih bar vy. If you now take the commutator of lx and vy, you get ih bar vz. ly with vy is zero. lz with vy is equal to minus ih bar vx. The final terms are lx uh, commutator with v sub z is minus ih bar vy. ly with vz is ih bar vx. And lz commutator with vz is equal to zero. So, if we look at the commutator of L sub z with v plus minus, because we've defined the v plus minus operator, we can just expand L z and, and uh, the v plus minus as commutator of L z and v x plus or minus i times the commutator of L z and v y. But we look up here and we see exactly what these are. Commutator of L z and v x is lz and vx is here. It's ih bar vy. Commutator of lz and vy is minus ih bar vx. So we get ih bar vy and then we have minus times minus i times i which is plus one. So you get plus or minus h bar vx. Well this is simply vx plus or minus ih ivy. So this is plus or minus h bar v plus minus. We can also do the commutator of l plus minus and v plus minus. It's a little bit more complicated. So now you have four terms. You have lx, commutator of lx vx plus or minus i times the commutator of lx vy plus or minus i times the, the quantity commutator of ly vx plus or minus i times commutator of ly vy. Well, clearly this term goes to zero, this term goes to zero, and these two terms give you values that are opposite to each other. So you get minus plus h bar vz from this one, because lx vy up here gives you ih bar vz, you get h bar times i squared, that flips the sign, so you get minus plus h bar vz. Then for this term, you have plus or minus i, and then this commutator, ly vx, gives you minus i h bar vz. So you have minus i h bar v sub z. And now the minus i times the i is plus, so you get plus or minus h bar vz. Here you have minus h bar v, minus plus h bar vz, that equals zero. So the commutator of the two raising operators or the commutator of the two lowering operators gives you zero. We can also do the commutator of L plus minus with vz. Well, that gives you Lx, commutator of Lx and vz plus or minus i times Ly vz commutator. And this gives you minus ih bar vy minus plus h bar vx. Again, using these nine relationships up here, which is minus plus h bar v plus minus. And finally, the last commutator we need to do is L plus minus commutator with v minus plus. So now it's L plus and L minus and L minus and, L and v plus. Again, we have Lx vx commutator minus plus i times Lx vy commutator plus or minus i times the quantity Ly vx commutator minus plus i ly vy commutator. Well again this term and this term cancel but now these two terms will add together because you're starting already with a, an inverted sign here. So you get plus or minus h bar vz plus or minus i times minus i h bar vz. These cancel to 1 and you get plus or minus 2 h bar v sub z. So if we put all these together, we get the following relationships uh, of commutators between L and Z. 
and L and V rather. LZ VZ is equal to zero. LZ commutator with V plus minus is plus or minus H bar V plus minus. Then you have L plus minus V plus minus commutator is zero. And then you have L plus minus V sub Z commutator is equal to minus plus H bar V plus minus. And finally, L plus minus commutator with V minus plus is plus two, plus or minus two H bar V sub Z. So just as with the scalar operator, we can use these relationships to generate the selection rules for vector operators by calculating matrix elements of the commutators. So let's do a simple one. Let's do L sub Z V Y, V plus minus, which is up here. So this commutator, if we put, put it in brackets, is going to be equal to plus or minus H bar V plus minus. So on the left side, we have plus or minus H bar, the inner product of V plus minus with the sandwich between L prime, N prime, L prime, M prime, and L, L, M. On the right side, we have the inner product of the commutator, LZ, V plus minus. Well, again, we can expand these out just like we did before for the scalars. And so we have N prime, L prime, M prime, LZ, V plus minus, and L, M minus n prime l prime m prime v plus minus lz and lm and now we do the same trick we move this over here we get an m prime we move this one over apply it to the right and we get an m and so we have on the left side plus or minus h bar n prime l prime m prime v plus minus and lm and on the right side we have m prime minus m h bar from these two terms, n prime, l prime, m prime, v plus minus, and lm. Now the matrix elements on these sides are identical. So we can now gather all these terms and realize that this gives me an extra plus or minus h bar. So if I bring everything over to uh, this side, I get minus plus h bar, and bring it in with the m, and I get m prime minus m plus or minus 1 times this inner product here is equal to 0. Clearly, if this is to be non-zero, then this defines a selection rule. And the selection rule says that either that matrix element is 0 or delta m is plus or minus 1. So you have a selection rule of delta m plus or minus 1 for uh, one of the rotational selection rules. Well, let's do another one. Another one would be the LZVZ equal to 0 uh, commutator. And we can write that again the same way. 0 is equal to the commutator sandwiched with the two states. This gives me LZVC sandwiched minus L, v, Z, L, Z in the sandwich, and I apply the L, Z to the right, L, Z to the left, and I get M minus, M prime minus M times the same matrix element of V, Z. So you get M prime minus M is equal to the matrix element of V, Z with N, L, M, N, all primes, and all non-primed. Well, clearly, this again gives you a selection rule for uh, this uh, vector operator that is delta m is equal to zero. So the selection rules for the first two commutators, the ones that we did here, this one and this one, which are the simplest ones to do, these are a little bit more challenging, give you that this matrix element with v plus is equal to zero unless delta m is plus one. This matrix element of V sub Z is equal to zero unless delta M is equal to zero. And the matrix element, the inner product with V minus is equal to zero unless delta M is minus one. And so we're starting to generate these commutator relations, these selection rules. The remaining three commutators uh, lead to selection rules for delta L, just like we had in the past, through a connection with the Klebsch-Gordon coefficients. So, um, these are the equations in the book. 
and we have n prime l prime m prime v plus nlm is equal to minus square root of 2 c and then these are the klebsch gordon coefficients with m1 and m prime and l1 and l prime times the reduced matrix element again the one that does not depend on m's n prime l prime v and l similarly you get the same thing for v minus with the same square root of 2 with a plus sign this time and a slightly different value for the klebsch gordon coefficient m minus 1 m prime and l 1 l prime and again the same reduced matrix element and finally for vz so these are the v plus v minus and vz uh, we get uh, a factor of 1 times the klebsch gordon coefficient that is identified by m0 m prime l1 l prime with the same reduced matrix element the coefficients are are specific representations of the klebsch gordon coefficients which are defined as c with m1 m2 and m and j1 j2 and capital j which relate to the addition of angular momentum these coefficients will vanish unless the rules of angular momentum addition are followed that is capital m is equal to m plus m1 plus m2 and capital j is equal to j1 plus j2 j1 plus j2 minus 1 all the way down to absolute value of j1 minus j2 so these klebsch gordon coefficients define selection rules and they lead to selection rules that say delta l is equal to plus or minus 1 and delta m is equal to plus 1. this klebsch gordon coefficient with the minus 1 below leads to delta L is equal to plus or minus 1 and delta M is equal to minus 1. And finally, this one with the 0 leads to delta L is equal to plus or minus 1 and delta M is equal to 0. So you can see clearly that when you look at this, this is the difference between the two is the number in between. So, the, the, so this one, delta L is plus or minus 1 delta L is plus or minus 1, delta L is plus or minus 1. Here, M, delta M is 1, delta M is minus 1, and delta M is 0. So that's how you read those terms. Overall, therefore, the selection rules are given by delta L is equal to 0 or plus or minus 1, and delta M is equal to 0 or plus or minus 1.